Hey guys, Richard Oldner here. One of the most common questions on the internet, what size injector should I use? I've got an NALS, I've got a Supercharged LS, I've got a Nitrous LS, or I've got a Turbo LS. What size injector should I use? Here's the answer. To get things started, we first need to answer the following question. What is a fuel injector? Now, rather than get into some sophisticated technical jargon, I'm going to answer this so everybody can understand it. A fuel injector basically is just a flow orifice. It's just an opening. And we are controlling the amount of fuel that flows through that opening with a solenoid. A solenoid basically opens and closes, uncovers that flow orifice so we can flow fuel through it. Now, the great thing is we control this solenoid electronically so that we can pulse with modulate, there goes our technical example, we can pulse with modulate this solenoid to open and close rapidly. We can control the precise amount of fuel going through this injector. If you want to think about it in real terms, take a look at the drain on your sink or on your shower or on your bathtub. If we cover that drain hole, we stop water flowing down the drain. If we then open it, now water can flow down the drain. And if we open and close that very rapidly like this, we can control the amount of water that's flowing into the drain. That's exactly what your fuel injector is doing. The solenoid is opening and closing, allowing fuel to flow through the orifice up to the flow limit of that injector. So now we've taken a look at what a fuel injector is. Let's take a look at some common injector sizes on the LS application. But know this, even though we're looking at LS injector size, this works for anything. A 30 pound injector for an LS application works on any motor, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, import, and domestic. Let's check them out. Now that we have a basic understanding of what fuel injectors are and what they do, let's take a look at the different applications used on the factory LS stuff. And remember, just because we're using these LS injectors, basically, though that the flow rates apply to any motor, whether it's a Ford, Chevy, Dodge, import, or domestic. So if you have a 30-pound injector, it will work on any sort of motor. But here are all the factory stuff. And don't worry, I'm going to put a matrix up at the end of this video that shows a listing for all of the different, basically, stock sizes, or at least the common ones. When I go to the wrecking yard, I knew, normally get a 4.8 or a 5.3. And those would have come with anywhere from a 21 to a 25 pound injector, depending on what the application was and what the year of the vehicle was. So let's take a 25 pound injector, for instance. We're going to use our secret number here, and that's the power of 16. So if we multiply the flow rate of the injector, in this case, let's take a 25 pound injector, multiply that by 16, that factory injector from a 4.8 or a 5.3 will support 400 naturally aspirated horsepower. And you can apply this 16 number to any flow rate. If you have a 50 pound injector, all of a sudden you can support 800 horsepower naturally aspirated. We're going to go into why all this stuff changes, how we got this 16 number, and a lot of cool stuff, but I'll put a matrix up at the end of the video that has a listing for basically all of the common factory size injectors and what power outputs they'll support both on gasoline and on E85. So let's do some, let's jump right into some math now and find out how much power each one of these stock ones will support. So the question now has to be for you guys, where does this magic 16 number come from? It actually comes from something we call the brake specific fuel consumption. Now the brake specific fuel consumption of the motor is basically how much fuel is required of the motor to make a given amount of power. Basically how efficient the motor is at producing the amount of power it produces given the amount of fuel that it uses. And a very good estimate for brake specific fuel consumption, a very common number, is 0.5. And that means it takes a half a pound of fuel per hour of fuel to produce one horsepower. Or put it another way, it takes, <laughs> the, the motor makes two horsepower for each pound of fuel. So if we take our number from our injector, let's say we have a 25 pound injector, we know that each one of those injectors for a single cylinder will support 50 horsepower in the case of a 25 pound injector. And if we multiply that by eight, because we have eight cylinders, that's how we get our 400 horsepower number. And the 16 number is just making that simple, making that equation much simpler. We take the two and we take the eight and we combine them together. If we multiply the flow of the injector times 16, that is our magic 16 number, that comes from a 0.5 brake specific. And that's a fairly good estimate for a lot of naturally aspirated motors. A lot of other motors can make it are much more efficient. The LS, in fact, can run more efficient than a 0.5 brake specific, and a lot of four valve numbers are much more efficient. So if we use a 
four brake specific number. In this case, a lower number is better. It means the motor is more efficient. If we use a 0.4 brake specific number, that same 20, those same 25 pound injectors will actually support 500 horsepower, but that is actually another test for another day. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens when we add boost to the equation and how the motor becomes technically less efficient. Now that we have a basic understanding of brake specific fuel consumption and how it relates to our magic 16 number, and that's because it takes a half a pound of fuel per hour to make one horsepower or two horsepower for one pound of fuel. And then we multiply that by the number of injectors, which is eight on our V8. That's where we get our 16. Now it can also be another number because it doesn't matter how many cylinders you have or how many injectors you have, you use that multiplier number. But on a turbo or supercharged application, our brake specific or the amount of fuel that we use will actually be much higher. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose we have a naturally aspirated LS motor that makes 600 horsepower and we have a turbocharged motor that also makes 600 horsepower. The turbo or supercharged motor making 600 horsepower will use more fuel. It will actually be less efficient in terms of fuel consumption and there are actually two reasons for that. The first one obviously is in most boosted applications we run the motor richer. So a typically on an NA motor we might run it in the high 12s even as lean as 13 to 1. On a turbo or supercharged combination, we're normally in the 11s, even down as low as 11.0, or sometimes even in the 10s for some of these applications. So we're using a lot more fuel because the motor is richer, but that's actually only one of the reasons. The other reason that a lot of people don't realize is the fact that there's hidden horsepower associated with turbo and supercharged combinations, especially on supercharged applications. So if we run a motor on the dyno, whether it's the engine dyno or the chassis dyno, the number that we're seeing, the actual power output, isn't all of the power that the motor is producing because it takes power, let's say, to drive the supercharger. That's what we call parasitic loss. Now, there are also some losses associated with a turbo. Those are pumping losses associated with back pressure and things like that, but they're not nearly as much as the parasitic loss associated with driving a supercharger. So if we have a supercharged application, it's already running richer, so it's going to be using more fuel for whatever power it's producing, and it's actually producing more power than we see because of those parasitic losses. And it took fuel to make the power to drive those parasitic losses. So we have two reasons why they use more fuel on a turbo and supercharged application. Now let's take a look at what happens when we change the fuel from either pump gas or race gas to something that requires a lot more fuel and that's E85. Now we took a look at what happens when we go from a naturally aspirated motor to a turbo or supercharged motor and why there's a big change in the brake specific fuel consumption. Part of that obviously is because we're going from a 13 to 1 air fuel ratio down to 11 So we're changing basically the amount of fuel that we use by 15 to 18 percent just by changing the air fuel that we run those motors at, you know, to keep them safe. The other thing is we talked about the parasitic loss and the pumping losses and that stuff, but we changed that just by changing the air fuel ratio and the amount of fuel that's being used. But another way that we change the amount of fuel that's being used is changing the type of fuel that we use. If we go from pump gas or even race gas over to something like E85, it requires more fuel flow and therefore an even larger injector to run at the same power output as it would with either gas or race gas. Now E85 requires about 25 or so percent more fuel flow because of change in the stoichiometric value between E85 and regular pump gas. Now, if we if we look at this at the same scale, so if we run E85 at 11.0 or 11.5 to 1 on a gas scale, we're still having to flow a lot more fuel. So if you're wanting to make that same 600 horsepower that we talked about previously with E85, you need an even bigger injector. Despite the fact that E85 will have a higher brake specific number, meaning that it is less efficient because it requires more fuel to make the same amount of power, that's not the whole story. The other side to E85 is it's less expensive, even though you have to buy more of it. It costs less per gallon than pump gas and definitely a lot less than race gas. The other thing is E85 all by itself, if you make no change to the air fuel or timing and the air fuel on the gas scale, obviously we're talking about, if you make no changes to that, E85 adding it all by itself 
itself is going to add more power. So you're going to be making more power even though you had to add a little bit of fuel. So that's going to change the brake specific number. The other thing that's going to change is because it has higher octane certainly than regular pump gas, you've already added a little bit of power from the E85 all by itself, but now you can also add more timing and that that again is going to add more power. So the brake specific number is not going to be quite as bad as we think because of the added fuel flow required to run E85. Now that we take a look at the brake specific fuel consumption under naturally aspirated motors and boosted motors in E85, let's take a look at the injectors themselves and what determines the flow rate of the injector. The first thing is obviously injectors are <laughs> rated at different flow rates and that's basically just the size of the flow orifice. We have in the factory LS stuff ranging from 21 pounds an hour all the way up to 54 pounds an hour and that's basically just the opening the flow rate or the, the flow size, the flow orifice of the injector itself. So as we open that solenoid up, up and we're allowed to flow. Some of them have bigger passages than others. That's a simple thing. The other thing that affects it is fuel pressure. All of the LS stuff is rated at that flow rate that they give you, whether it's 21 or 25 or 30, 36, all the way up to 54, that's rated with a fuel supply of 58 PSI. Now, all, not all injectors are rated at that flow rate, or rated at that fuel pressure rate. A lot of the earlier injectors on 5 liter Mustangs and other applications were rated down at 43 PSI. So what happens is on those, on those, uh, the Mustang ones rated at 43 PSI, if we were to raise it to the fuel pressure supplied on LS stuff, 58 PSI, their flow rate would actually go up. Conversely, if we took the LS injectors and put our fuel system together and only ran 43 PSI, they're not going to supply as much fuel and not going to be able to support as much power because the flow rate of the injector is going to go down. So it's the size of the orifice and the fuel pressure supplying that orifice that determines the flow rate. Other things also determine the flow rate of that injector that are kind of outside the injector itself. And that means the fuel pump. If you have something that's going to change the flow rate of the fuel pump, pump and therefore change the fuel pressure, obviously that will change the flow rate of injector. And some of the things that do that are obviously the pump size itself and the pump speed as well, which basically is a function of voltage supplied to the pump. So a lot of pumps are rated at 12 to 13 volts. But if you look at like a Kenny Bell Boosta pump or any of these other uh, voltage supply amplifiers, if we increase that to 17 volts or even as much as 20 volts supplied to that pump, the pump's going to spin faster, it's going to support more fuel flow, and it's going to raise the pressure, and that's going to supply more fuel flow for the injectors. The other thing that does it are other restrictions that happen in the fuel system. Things like fuel filters, fuel rail size, and line size, all of those things will usually manifest themselves as a change in fuel pressure. And sometimes you might only see this at really high fuel flow demand. So if you're like, you're trying to make a thousand horsepower and you have these tiny little lines or you have restrictive uh, fuel filters, you might not see a drop in fuel pressure until like the top of the RPM range. The other thing that happens is you can change the fuel pressure supplied to the injector with a regulator, with a boost reference regulator, boost and or vacuum reference. So what you want to do is, the injector is rated at 50, it's rated at its flow rate at 58 PSI. That means you have to have a constant 58 PSI. On a regulator, if you boost reference it, when you add boost, on the bottom side of the injector, it's having to flow against that boost. So if it has 58 PSI and it has 10 pounds flowing against it, that's only a delta of 48 PSI. Now that injector will only flow what that injector flows at 48 PSI. And the way that we get around that is to hook a simple reference line up to the regulator so it goes up at a one-to-one -one rate. So it will always have that delta of 58 PSI because it'll have extra pressure basically to offset the boost pressure. So that's a good thing. Yeah, but the other thing is a lot of people don't realize this. This also works in reverse. When you have that reference line going to the regulator and you have vacuum there, that will lower the fuel pressure. And a lot of times this isn't a problem because normally vacuum happens under light or under idle and light crews and things like that where you don't need a whole bunch of fuel supply. In fact, it, a lot of times it's a good idea to take fuel supply away, especially if you have a really, really big injector and you're having trouble controlling it vacuum referencing that line will lower the fuel pressure and take away fuel flow, which is exactly what you want when there's not a big fuel demand.
Now that we all understand injectors a little bit better, let's take a look at this injector matrix that I've designed. And what it does is list a number of the factory LS injectors. Now it's not all of them, but honestly, we don't really need to list all of the available injectors, nor do I need to give you O-ring sizes or lengths or the different kinds of plugs or any of that. All of that stuff is available online. What I'm trying to show you with this matrix is how much power each of these very common injectors can actually support. This will give you a good idea what you need to do in terms of injector flow to support the kind of power you're looking at. So we started out with the smallest 21 pound injectors used in the little 4.8 and 5.3 truck motors, and we've gone all the way up to the factory 54 pound injectors. But I've also included aftermarket injectors, so we've gone beyond the factory stuff, because let's face it, if you're gonna run a turbo or supercharged application, you're gonna wanna make a lot of power, so you need a bigger injector. And this is especially the case if you're wanting to run E85. So in this matrix, what I've done is given you the fuel flow, the injector size basically, I've shown you how much power you can make with that injector NA at a 0.5 brake specific. But remember, if you can do, if you can improve upon that, which a lot of guys can have a much better brake specific number, you can actually make more power with that injector size with a better, with a better brake specific number. I've also included, in addition to the NA power output you can make, I've shown you what boosted power output that injector size will support. And then I've also shown you what boosted on E85 power output that injector will support. And as you've seen, because we have to flow a lot more fuel, the amount of power that that injector will support is much, much lower when we're boosted and run on E85. And remember, when we talked about the fact that if you're running a turbo or supercharged combination, there are also hidden power losses that are not taken into account when you're running something on the dyno, especially this is the case with a, a supercharged application because you have parasitic losses associated with driving that blower. So if you're only making 700 at the tire or 800 at the tire, you might be making closer to 900 or 950 because <laughs> that motor obviously is making more power. It's having to produce the power for those parasitic losses. So it's kind of hard to get those uh, combinations run and get the calculations right. But that's why we always, when we're choosing injectors, we choose an injector that's bigger than we want. If you're trying to make 600 horsepower, you don't pick an injector that will just make 600 horsepower. You pick an injector size that will make 700 or 750 or even 800. It's the same thing when we're picking turbos. If we pick a turbo, we wanna make 600 horsepower, we don't pick a 600 horsepower turbo. We pick a 700 or even 800 horsepower turbo so we have room to grow and so we can run that turbo in its efficiency range. It's the same thing with an injector. Pick an oversized injector to make it easier on the injector, but don't pick too big of an injector because the problem is on the other side, when we're talking about idle and drivability, if we pick an injector that will support two or 3,000 horsepower, it's gonna, get, it's gonna be really hard to get that thing to idle and drive nice, especially on a smaller motor. So take a look at all the information provided in this matrix, and here's the other thing. I know a lot of guys are gonna say, but Richard, you didn't show me what a 60-pound injector will support. No, I didn't, but I don't have to. That's the great thing about this matrix. Take a look at a 30 pound injector and then double it. Or if you wanna know what a 75 pound injector, which I also I didn't include, take a look at a 25 pound injector and triple it. It's just simple math. All right, Richard Holder guys, make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all this stuff, and I will keep testing.